Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about how nonprofits can invest in solar energy, renewable energy to improve their resilience and also uh, help their finances with our special guest, Chuck Green, Executive Director of Cedars of Marin, which is a disability organization. Jason Jackson, Jay Jackson, Chief Executive Officer of Vital Energy Solutions, and Donato Rojas, uh, Project Developer and Essential Solar Services Managing Director. Thank you all for joining us. This is I'm so excited about this. And for full disclosure, we literally just had an outage of our central electrical and we also are running on solar energy and batteries, which just, you know, God is telling us, be resilient. And if we hadn't been this resilient, we wouldn't be here. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Donato. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So Chuck, I'm going to go to you first because really the core here isn't about energy. It's about service to community. So talk a little bit about what Cedars of Marin does, and then also your physical facilities that allow you to do this. And then let's let's go to uh, Jay and Donato, and let's talk about how this project ended up coming to fruition, your initial conversations, the, the genesis of the idea, and how that actually unfolded. Chuck, uh, take it away in terms of what Cedars of Marin does. Just context a little bit is that Cedars has actually been around for 105 years. And we provide independence, defend dignity, and realize each person's full potential for 200 individuals with developmental disabilities. That's who we are. That's what we focus all our time and energy on. That's why everything we do is focused on that. You know, we have a tagline that actually, in some ways, I think, I think communicates even better. It's um, Cedars promotes, you know, creative, productive, joyous, and healthy lives for our clients. And again, that's 200 individuals and a bunch of different programs. So that's kind of who we are, what our mission is, what our purpose is. And we're just very, very focused on making that happen with a staff that's just incredible. How many staff do you have and what is your facilities like? What is your physical footprint like in order to provide that service? You know, it's complicated. There are actually about 150 staff, uh, and they're in about 12, 14 different facilities. So we have a main campus, uh, which is right near where I am now, in San Anselmo. And that's a beautiful uh, setting where each client has their own um, rooms that have, you know, kitchenettes and bathrooms, very much better than I ever had uh, in my college dorm, that's for sure. Really nice. And then we have eight group homes. Each group home has eight clients, again, each person with their own room. That's the residential setting, and that accommodates about 100 individuals, people who have been living at Cedars for a long time. We have one resident who has been living uh, at Cedars in one of the residences for 92 years. And so in addition to that, then we have some of the infrastructure um, places, you know, residences and, um, you know, facilities. Uh, but we also have three-day programs, and that's really important. So it's the residential, but then three-day programs. And um, they've each won uh, a bunch of different awards in a way. And so um, the first is... Uh, community connections, where our participants um, give back, actually, by volunteering at other local nonprofit organizations, such as the Marine Mammal Center, Marine General Hospital, Marine Headlands. And some of these folks, our folks have been doing that for 10, 20, 30 years. So it's a connection to the community. We have our fine arts studio. Um, it uh, It's where artists express their creativity and develop professional art skills. They receive guidance from professional artists in a range of different art mediums, such as drawing, painting, sculpture, jewelry making. We have a gallery right downtown San Anselmo where clients 
uh, sell their art. They get 50% of the proceeds. It's It was once awarded the sort of second best art gallery in Marin County. And then the Textile Arts Collaborative, collaborative sorry, which is a 22-acre ranch in San Rafael that offers a whole range of activities and opportunities to earn income through weaving and gardening and cooking and animal husbandry and art, as well as a senior program for those folks who have been around for a while and actually want to retire away and, and take it easy. So those are our programs and the facilities. Um, you know, one of the things that's not quite as evident and it's kind of a represents a change in how the world perceives people with disabilities and that's that we work really hard for people to have a sense of belonging so that our town the the places we're at in Novato and San Anselmo and Ross in particular our people are part of the community and are doing things all the time. And the destigmatization of what it means to have a developmental disability is something we work hard to dispel, whether it's with, you know, first graders, second graders, or seniors. And so they're completely involved and the towns totally embrace us. You know, this is such a great setup because you have here a whole bunch of individuals who collectively are forming a small town. So this is this is daily living. Mm -hmm. But then you also have medical needs that these people have. So you need devices that are able to be run by electricity that that are so important to someone's health. You have a you have small businesses that are uh, that are being supported. Donato, I understand that that initially. Uh, you and Chuck had a relationship and somehow that resulted in in this project where you ended up doing a lot of, of solar work and and uh, renewable energy work over at uh, at Cedars. Tell us how that unfolded. Yes, um, <clears throat> I was approached by Cedars Life Facility and Organizational Safety Manager, John Pope at the time. Uh, this was a couple of years back. We're talking about maybe uh, 2021. And one of the things that uh, Cedars has been attempting to do is take advantage of uh, renewable energy to reduce their operating, their electrical operating cost. And they've had experiences with other developers who weren't able to uh, just figure a good, figure out a good solution for their facilities. So... Um, I started looking at the project, working with uh, Mr. John Pope, and discussing the possibilities of uh, of a solar system and what would be the major incentives and savings on a operational basis for the entire facility and the rest of their portfolio. At the time, um, there weren't any direct incentives to for nonprofits. So it made the structuring and the uh, solution a little bit more complicated than uh, other organizations that do pay taxes. That being said, um, some, some administration uh, changes happened on a federal level that allowed the this particular project to come into a reality and a fruition, which uh, now um, nonprofits are able to actually take advantage of the income tax credit. So one of the things that we did, we, we approached the project, we, look at, we looked at the energy uh, usage on a per site basis, on a granular level, yearly level, monthly, weekly level, and determine what possibilities are there in terms of um, energy savings. Um, one of the most interesting things that we wanted to avoid was that they are located in a high fire threat area and experience multiple power outages from PG&E and the utility that provides power to their facilities. So we wanted to make sure that not only did the solution that we offered reduce the energy usage that, that they have and savings, but also provided backup during an event that they have um, uh, power outages or anything like that, uh, whether the utility turned it off or um, there's some wildfires that made made that a situation where they had to 
basically rely on. Uh, so let me break in right here because this is really fascinating. In order to bring this together, you have to have the, the engineering competencies and the construction competencies in order to do the installation itself. You have to have the competencies to configure the system, but you're also doing this in reference to financial considerations, tax considerations uh, at the federal and at the state level. So you're designing solutions um, that involve all these different competencies. And at a certain point, you have to settle on what your project plan is, right? Yes. Yes. So, uh, Jay, uh, could you jump in and, and talk a little bit about uh, how Vital um, started to get involved and and uh, how the project started to unfold? Well, I appreciate that, uh, Mark. Thank you. First, I want to say uh, thanks, Chuck. It's, it's an honor to uh, be a part of um, contributing to uh, help your organization become more independent. And that's 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 what we're about. We're about energy independence here and um, uh, helping, you know, uh, nonprofits like yourself uh, take advantage of incentives that are out there as well as uh become a place that is more resilient for both your community and your residents. So it's really an honor to be a part of that. Um, the uh, the technical side of this, it really, when you have a solar, solar system's great. Solar systems offset the, the cost and uh, provide a return on investment that is usually very quick. And um, it financially, it just makes sense every time. There's, there's no. I, I've, I've almost never seen it not pencil where it's just like, hey, it's a no brainer. Let's get solar. I mean, it's like free pancakes on Sunday. You know, it's like, of course you want that, right? <laughs> so, battery is a little trickier. It's, it's, it's. You know, as as everyone knows, who's it's, it's a little expensive and um, can be cost prohibitive pretty often. Batteries is a nice, clean way to uh, provide. Uh, power in shorter term outages and um, and 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 create a you know um, uh, ease of of workflow so a lack of interruption for daily business needs especially when we have residents on site who are dependent on uh, you know um, keeping their food cold on uh, you know medications uh, whatever it may be these are these are important factors to take into consideration with coming up a backup power system so in this case. We did. Uh, we recommended batteries, which were incentivized through the S chip program. Um, that we could we could talk forever on that. I'll, I'll keep it you know short and sweet. There are more incentives in fire threat areas than there are for non fire threat areas. We're we had the opportunity here to take advantage of substantial offset of portion of their cost. Um, we can go into more detail if you'd like. Denali can provide that. But one of the things we incorporated here is. Uh, you know, we we are you know um, on the on the coast here, and uh, we also want to take into consideration winter time outages. What do you do in inclement weather, or if the facility goes offline in the middle of the night when um, the solar uh, aspect is not available? So we actually have a generator as well. So in combination of those three devices, we've created a design and um, a, a, a project where. Um, we have we're getting to a place where we don't aren't dependent on the utility anymore. It, we've created an independent microgrid that can function for multiple days without uh, any action from a utility uh, provider. So and that's uh, you know that's that's the thing. We're going to talk a little bit about the details of the actual systems configuration, but what you're talking about in concept is that in certain places where there are fire hazards, where there are sensitive um, user requirements, it is important to have that backup. And now the solution is available where you can create a little microgrid. It used to be that you would have to install these huge generators in places like hospitals. But now mm -hmm. in a place like Cedars, which doesn't necessarily have the financial resources of an enormous hospital, you can actually, at a, on an economical basis, install uh, solar, install batteries, install backup generators, so that regardless as to what happens, when you have a service interruption, uh, you're covered. So let's talk a little bit about about how this this was. Was was 
were all of the panels located in one location or did you have multiple locations where you installed the panels and how many panels did you end up installing? Um, the exact number of panels, I'll let Donato uh, take that, but in general, the basic design is, uh, you know, you're always going for the most cost effective way to implement, uh, you know, solar and batteries for a customer and um, rooftop is usually the most cost effective way as opposed to covered carports and, and new structures that support the solar. You also have shade to take into considerations and there are a lot of trees around the area. So we did a thorough shading analysis and was very much part of that and um, and NESS and uh basically came up with a uh, rooftop that involved basically everything facing east, south, or west. All of the, okay. uh, you know, primary uh, azimuths that would produce the most energy for them on site uh, and be the most economical um, and provide the most power in terms of kilowatts. Uh, the battery, you know, the, the way that works is... Uh, you know, the, the, in the event of a backup, just real quick, overall design, I know it wasn't specific to your question, but, you know, the solar can is constantly charging the batteries in the event of an outage during the day. And usually that battery will go well into the night at a certain point in time and low battery alert, either, you know, the sun comes up and the sun starts producing power again, or the batteries will kick on and trickle charge the batteries back up to state. So they're never really down. It can go almost indefinitely. Uh, there are, uh, Dana, you want to jump in on uh, the exact specifics on kilowatts and number of panels, et cetera? I, I do. And uh, and Jay, I'm, I'm going to just, I, I want to thank Chuck as well and, and Mark for, Having this webinar and and what we're doing here, I think it's it's a great thing. And basically, in terms of the components, uh, when we were looking at the components, we wanted to make sure that the Cedars facility was resilient to any kind of uh, particular uh, scenarios. And what do we mean by that? It had uh, a solar system that functions whether it's connected to the grid or off grid. It has a battery storage system of 184 kilowatt hours that is able to uh, basically power the Cedars facility during an outage for 12 hours. And in addition to that, it has an 80 kW generator. The, the purpose of all these different uh, microgrid components, um, it's, 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 they're there for resiliency purposes. In the event that there is an outage during the day, the solar system powers the battery and is able to operate throughout the outage. And in addition to that, the battery is able to operate at nighttime without any energy from the solar side. Uh, in, in the event that, let's say that there's a wildfire and there's smoke overcast, or it's a very cloudy day that uh, solar production cannot happen. In certain events where there's unfavorable conditions, the generator will kickstart and power the battery and allow the facility to continue operating. So um, equipment and developing a situation like that not only required our expertise, but also vital energy in terms of the um, expertise in construction and development as well from their side. So we made sure that we partnered in order to um, design, develop, install, and operate a microgrid that uh, Cedars of Marin can 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 value can can be uh, can provide power during an outage and uh, just provide them with better infrastructure for the uh, for 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 the new kind of scenarios that we're experiencing in terms of the Chuck, how long have you had the, uh, the 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 system? So I'm I'm sorry to to talk over you, uh, Donato. Um, how long have you had the system that Donato just described? Uh, it goes up in about three weeks. <laughs> it goes up in about three weeks. So we, we, we're going to have to have a check-in report. We better right? be getting some energy. Mm -hmm. Excuse yeah. me, you're already getting energy? No, no, I say we better be getting some good energy, yeah. Mm -hmm. You so, know, I think when we looked at it, I think the, the, the obvious primary criteria is how it impacts clients. And the easiest analogy uh, to come up with is, can you imagine if a hospital didn't have a backup plan? 
I mean, all the chaos that would happen and the lives that would be threatened. So mm -hmm. we're a mini version of that, but we still, it's the same kind of people uh, that have, uh, they're vulnerable population. And so there are medications that need to be cooled, all kinds of things like that. So having that kind of a resource available to us just mitigates a whole bunch of problems. I think the other thing that people obviously are going to consider is the cost. And, um, you know, every time you make it an important decision, there's sort of a cost benefit analysis of, you know, how much is it going to cost? What's going to be the return? What do you get? Well, the primary return is obviously around just having the energy and the service. But financially, we did an analysis, you know, Vital did an analysis up front and said, we're projecting you can save 14 or get a return of your investment of 14.7% uh, a year. And we thought, well, that's better than putting it in the bank. So the first concern or criteria for any organization is you have the money to put out. I mean, you still have to have enough resources that you can spend. And, you know, the original big picture budget was $900,000 plus, but with all the um, rebates and all the things that Vital was able to uh, provide and connect us to, it's around $600,000. So you've got the, a huge return right there. But even still, when I looked at... Um, or July, I just thought I'd do it for the webinar. You know, I looked and realized that the electric bill in the facility where the panels are now, the electric bill alone from PG&E in July was $10,000. So you multiply that times 12, that's $120,000. That's closer to a 20% return. And, you know, and that's because in addition to just accurately projecting what the return would be, PG&E costs have gone crazy. And so we're protected. So it's great for operating moving forward when you do an operating budget. It's all, you know, it's cash flow. How much money can you raise? What, you know, all you get. Not having to pay $120,000 in an electric bill is great. Well, let's, let's also look at this from a nonprofit perspective, right? It's a capital project. You can raise money for capital projects, and in particular, raising money for a capital project that has a net positive cash flow is a very interesting proposition. If you're going to yeah. spend money, spending money on something that actually has a net positive cash flow is a pretty compelling value proposition for donors, isn't it? Yes, it's it's it really is, and you know I've been an executive director of a foundation. So I know what those people are looking at. And certainly having something that has such a great dual return, financial and service, it's really compelling for groups. Um, you know, we actually, uh, we're looking at our eight group homes now to see if we want to proceed and put the uh, solar panels on all of them in addition to the main campus. And uh, HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development, our, five of our homes are uh, partially funded by HUD resources. And we have a grant request into them uh, that we'll hear in about a month that will give us about $2 million if that comes through. And so the second we hear about that, we're going to sign up uh, the group homes. Get now, there are two other benefits here. Uh, you know, in addition to resilience and in, in, in addition to the fact that you can raise money for these types of projects, you're sustainably lo lowering the cost base basis of your operations, which is huge because yeah. money is running through our fingers every day. Those little costs and not so little costs to PG&E and so on and so forth, those costs can actually uh, be sustainably reduced. And then the, the other piece is, is one that really impacts all of us. We want to try and be more self-sufficient as a value. And we also want to do something that is good for everyone, for the planet. Is there any downside that you could see here of, of actually making these types of investments, particularly in Sunbelt areas? So I'm thinking of the Southwest, I'm thinking about California, 
there might be some some questions if you're if you're in a uh, in an overcast area or whatever. But in these areas where the sun is a is a resource, do you all see any downside here um, to, to to taking this type of a step? I mean, it's no, an authentic I question. Think, right? I think the only key question a nonprofit or any a business has to ask is: Do you have the resources up front to invest? You know, it wouldn't be great if you had to go to a bank and borrow a million dollars to put up a solar system. But for our purposes, we were able to put the money up front and said, you know, we can get a much better return by doing this. So just from a financial perspective, it made sense. But we had to have that money up front. If we didn't have the cash flow to do it, it would have been a tough sell. So, Jay Donato, mm -hmm. um, you encounter this all the time. If, if if that's the major impediment and if there are other impediments, please, please, please. Uh, please throw those out on the table as well. How do you help people overcome that initial investment issue? Sure. There are, uh, there are certainly different structures, more creative structures than was done here if an entity is not able to come up with the actual cash um, to pay for a project. But the way the incentives all work is... Um, most of it is in arrears. It's you. You have to pay for the project, complete the project, then apply for those funds, and then receive those funds back. And you have to basically prove that you paid for the project to to get those incentives. So it certainly can be tricky. So the the entire project cost has to be covered. Now we've looked at ways uh, internally where we can assist and. Um, uh, possibly even, um, you know, accept those uh, incentives in lieu of payment. But again, the system is set up a little tricky. Like the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, which is uh, basically uh, allowed nonprofits to monetize the tax credit uh, in, 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 in the form of a check in lieu of the tax credit, uh, because they're a nonprofit, they don't pay taxes. Um, January 1st of 2023, for the first time, that was available to nonprofits ever in history. So we're pretty excited that that's available there. Uh, is, to me, nonprofits have always been an underserved portion of the community. We're out here doing solar every day, and we have for 30 years, but we haven't been able to. It's always been a complex, trans, complex transaction financially, as well as usually involves third-party ownership, <clears throat> which is still an option here. And what I mean by that is a lot of times either maybe a um, high net worth individual or an investment firm will get involved, provide that capital, actually own the project, and uh, you know, and then flip the ownership after a few years to so they can monetize the tax credit and then the nonprofit still receives all the benefits a little more complicated a little more legal fees kind of drives costs up a bit but still a, a very practical way of getting nonprofit projects completed donato you want to make any comments from your uh font of uh, of experience in terms of of how you end up getting to the point where you can say go because of the the finances are all uh in place yes mark i would say the only downsides is your uh landscaping bill may go up a little bit by requiring tree pruning right <laughs> <laughs> but um in 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 terms of uh, the operational savings for example cedars they're saving about sixty thousand dollars per year of energy costs because of the once the solar system is operational in addition to that the federal incentive pays 30 percent of the cost of the entire solar system and battery system itself. And in this case, they actually qualify for state incentive for the battery portion, which covers 159,000 of the, of the battery cost. Um, they have a payback period of less than five years. So wow. in, 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 in cases where the nonprofits have the, the cash available, it's a great investment. And even if they don't have the cash available, like Jason uh, mentioned, there are different mechanisms or structuring, uh, whether it's a loan or a power purchase agreement or an energy service agreement, uh, there's ways to to make it happen and have a great payback return. So it's it's a great investment for nonprofits and yeah. the, the, the current infrastructure and the federal investment tax credit, how it's uh, structured now, 
I know. I like it for for nonprofits, it's it's a great opportunity for nonprofits, and we we're we're great to be part of that and having those the opportunity to provide those solutions to nonprofits. I'd like to to add to that. Um, you know the uh, the one thing there, the, the simplest transaction if a nonprofit is unable to, uh, it, it doesn't have the cash, is to take out a loan. Because as Donato just said, and, and you, you hear Chuck talking about the savings, it's substantial savings. And payback means in this business, um, you know, at what point in time do you break even? So you're talking about installing solar, batteries, generators, this stuff is all going to last, you know, 15 to 25 years of producing money and saving costs every single day of the week, all day, every day. And it's paid off in five years. So after that, it's free income. That's what it is. It is basically making you money and providing that resiliency every single day. Um, five years uh, break even is an extremely short period of time for this level of an investment. So it's it it really is um, a um, practical way to address uh, cost increases over time. And um, I, I don't know if anybody's noticed their PG&E bill lately or their utility bill, but they're kind of getting up there a little bit. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, here locally in our utility PG&E, they've been approved uh, by the Public Utilities Commission to increase rates another 18% by the end of the year. Yes. So we're looking at additional increases. So this is a hedge against that inflation. No question. Well, Chuck, how long did you say Cedars of Marin have been, has been around? We've been around for 105 years. So if if these if these uh, systems last, let's say 20 years, I know they, they're rated for 25, but let's let's go down five. We're talking about a 15-year net positive on the total investment. It seems like a no-brainer, particularly for an organization that has been around for 105 years, right, Chuck? Yep. So I'd like to thank you all for- hey, Can uh, I mention one other thing? Sure. You know, just, <laughs> um, you know it, I would not have done this on my own. I would not have sat back here and said, you know, I think Cedars could benefit for this. Let me do the research. Let me find out what's available. And my guess is there aren't too many, certainly nonprofits, probably not a whole lot of businesses that have the expertise internally to do that. And my advice would be to find a partner who you can trust and who helps make all the decisions clear. They don't make the decisions for you, but they at least need to make it really clear and find out, be sort of aggressive on helping to provide those other kind of incentives or rebates or things. Because again, I wouldn't know about those things. And that's what we did with Vital. And that that's what made the project really worth doing. Because you know, otherwise it would be really easy to step in it, you know? You know, you're, you're making such an important point. It's a values point, right? It's basically about taking people who are competent in their own areas and placing that in service to community. And that issue of trust, the issue of clarity, the issue of teamwork, right? This is the way we all should function. We're not trying to extract. We're trying to sustain and serve. And that's basically what we're talking about. Jason Jackson of Vital Energy Solutions, Donato Rojas of Vital Energy and ESS, and Chuck Green, the Executive Director of Cedars of Marin. Thank you so much for sharing this experience. It's so important. People can be instructed by the route that you've taken and, and replicated for themselves. I am so very grateful for your insights and for sharing your experience with us. Mark, appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you very much. much.